thank you so much for tuning in to our online service this morning. I, I just want you to know you've been prayed over. Uh, we pray over every video we put out that God will use it to magnify His name, to glorify His Son, Jesus Christ. We, we plead that. Uh, we want you to feel comfortable in our worship. So when we're singing, you sing. When we're praying, you pray. And, and you feel free to take notes and do all that stuff as we, we proclaim the truth of the Word this morning. Uh, we want you to feel invited. So if, if you see that comment section there, if you're watching on YouTube, you can certainly type questions into that. We have people monitoring that. Uh, just know that we're, we're here for you the best we can be, uh, but we're so thankful that you've tuned in. Uh, we ask that, that God blesses you, that God multiplies his word, and, and that he does incredible things in your life for tuning in to Palmerdale Cross Live today. We love you, and thank you for your faithfulness. Good morning. Welcome to Palmerdale Cross. Who's ready to worship the Lord today? Let's all stand and let's open up our service with This is Amazing Grace. Amen, 
Amen, amen, amen. Good morning. You may have a seat for just a moment as we've got some things to do this morning that are exciting and, and they are spiritually edifying to the soul and to the eyes and to the mind. Uh, we're ecstatic that you are here. I am Jeff. I have uh, been called the pastor here for the last seven years and God has been so good to our church and he's been such a, a blessing to our community using this church as a, a beacon of hope and a beacon of good news. And so we're excited that you're here. If today is your first Sunday with us ever. Welcome to Palmerdale Cross. Our greatest hope today is that you will encounter a living, holy God that sets you free to worship Him today. Uh, we are a bunch of people who are messed up. We're a bunch of people who have issues. We're a bunch of people who have problems. Uh, but when we come to church together, when we become the body of Christ together, uh, we become a, a unified spirit um, that God is working on day by day through the process of sanctification and glorification. So we're excited. Today we get to baptize. Uh, every time we get to baptize, it's a huge deal. I want to just take a moment before we do and tell you a little bit about how we look at baptism and what baptism is. Baptism is the outward profession of what God has already done in the spiritual. Uh, we, are, we are showing by our testimony uh, that we have been redeemed. So through the death, burial, and resurrection, we show that by baptism. We baptize by immersion. And what that means is, is when somebody gets into our, our baptistry, their whole body is going under the water and right back up. So Miss Dina Conger is going to go first this morning. And so, Ms. Dina, you come on out here. I'll help you in. Ms. Dina, you came forward last week in our invitation, and you professed Christ as, as Lord. So tell us today why you need to be baptized. Because I accepted Jesus. Because you accepted Jesus as your Savior. So there's no doubt in your mind that you belong to the Most High King. Amen. Amen. Let's, let's pray and receive that. Father, I thank you for my sister's confession. God, I thank you that you've called her from death to life. I'm thankful for her story. That for so long of her life, she was playing church. She knew the church things to say and the church things to do. But God, seven days ago, you called her from death to life. And walking with you is no longer a game. Walking with you is no longer a theory. But walking with you is now her story. God, thank you for redeeming my sister. Ms. Dina, because of your profession of faith in Jesus Christ, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Pastor Matt's going to come, and he's got some more baptisms, some great things that God did at, at student camp, and then uh, he, he is going to baptize his niece today. Just don't hold her head under too long, okay? Amen. Amen. Am I live? Am I on? Can you hear me? All right. Baptism is an exciting time in the life of a Christian, a new believer. This is Allie Imler. Um, church family, it was brought to my attention that um, this morning there's a lot of chaos and a lot of things that went on and just a lot of stuff that happened and I will walk in you can ask Sherry Rogers sometimes I'll walk in the office and I say Sherry I'm gonna have a good day whether you like it or not and she'll laugh and it'll be fun and so I I made a comment walking into the church I said Satan we're gonna have a good day whether you like it or not Amen. so I want you all to do me a favor I want you to be part of baptism when you see her come up I want you to be loud there's nothing about baptism that needs to be proper or anything in Scripture that said that when John the Baptist baptized, that that big burly man was dainty when he did things. I'm not going to hold his, her head under long, but when she comes up, I want you to let her know. Got it? All right. So this is Allie Emler. Allie had head knowledge. She understood what raising up in a church meant. She understood what she was supposed to do. But then she got saved and things changed. And she realized a few months ago that she needed to be baptized on the right side of the cross. So Allie, I'm going to ask you the most important question in all the world. Do you know Jesus to be your personal Lord and Savior? Yes, sir. All right. 
I baptize you, Ali and Lord, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There's nothing special about this water. It's just water. Uh, but for some reason, it did not want to let her go under. <laughs> All right, next I got Landon Hooper. Landon is one of our students here at the church. He went to uh, Student Life Rec Camp with us. Let's go this way. Oh, there we go. Good job. All right, Landon, while at camp, heard the message about Jesus and his love for us and coming to die on the cross for us. And he said he wanted to be part of that. He asked Jesus to come into his heart. So I'm going to ask you, Landon, what's the, uh, the most important question in all the world? Do you know Jesus to be your personal Lord and Savior? Mm -hmm. All right. So I baptize you, my brother, Landon Hooper, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So and he got this little part of his hair is not wet, but he's still baptized. Amen. <laughs> All right. Praise the Lord. All right. Uh, I was talking to Gary Conger, and one of the things that he had mentioned uh, was <clears throat> when his daughter Holly had gotten baptized, what, three years ago? About three years ago, it was just a blessing for her to come to salvation and, and uh, to be baptized. And so on the day she got baptized, he sang a solo, uh, My Chains Are Gone. And so now Dina being baptized today, uh, he wanted to sing today, and so the praise team is going to sing that. is 
everywhere. My chains are gone. My chains are gone. I've been set free. My God, my Savior has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns. Unending love, amazing Let's all stand and continue worshiping. Remember those walls that we call sin and shame. They were like prisons that we couldn't escape. But he came and he died and he rose. Those walls are rubble now. We call death and grave. They were like mountains that stood in our way. But he came and he died and he rose. Those giants are dead now. This is our God. This is who he is. He loves us. This is our God. This is what he does. He saves us. For the cross, beat the grave, let heaven and earth proclaim, this is our God, King Jesus. Remember that fear that took our breath away, faith so weak that we could barely pray, but he heard every word, every whisper. Those altars in the wilderness Tell the story of his faithfulness Never once did he fail And he never will This is our God, this is who he is He loves us This is our God, this is what he does He saves us He bore the cross, beat the grave let heaven and earth proclaim, this is our God, King Jesus. Who pulled me out of that pit? He did, he did. Who paid for all of our sin? Nobody but Jesus. Who pulled me out of that pit? He did, he did. Who paid for all of our sin? Nobody but Jesus. Who rescued me from that grave? Yahweh, Yahweh. Who gets the glory and praise? Nobody but Jesus. Who rescued me from that grave? Yahweh, Yahweh. Who gets the glory and praise? Nobody but Him. This is our God. This is who He is. He loves us. This is our God. This is what He does. He saves us. He bore the cross, beat the grave, let heaven and earth proclaim, this is our God, King Jesus. He bore the cross, beat the grave, let heaven and earth proclaim, this is our God, King Jesus. Amen. We 
serve a faithful God. And let's just sing and let's just let this be true worship unto our, unto our God. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou time, Brother Tommy Thompson is going to be singing. You know, it's always been my, my prayer that God is blessed through any, anything I do for him, especially singing, that there be no distractions, but only that glorify, God will be glorified himself. my 
my ship would be no more. I thank God for the lighthouse I owe my life to Him. For Jesus is my lighthouse and from the rocks of sin He has shown a light around me that I could clearly see if it wasn't for the lighthouse tell me where would this ship be everybody that lives about us they say tear that old lighthouse down the big ships don't sail this way anymore there's no use of it standing round then my mind goes back to a stormy night when just in time i saw the light yes the light from that that stands up there on the hill. And I thank God for the lighthouse. I owe my life to Him. For Jesus is the lighthouse. And from the rocks of sin, he has shown a light around me that I could clearly see. If it wasn't for the lighthouse, where would this ship be? And I thank God for For Jesus is my lighthouse, and from the rocks of sin, He has shown a light around me that I could clearly see. If it wasn't for the lighthouse, tell me where would this ship be? If it wasn't for that lighthouse, tell me where would this ship be? Amen, amen, amen. At this time, we're going to dismiss our kiddos to Children's Church. So if you see a bunch of kids escaping, they're good. And they'll meet Miss Marie or so, yeah, Miss Marie, and they will they will go back to Children's Church, and you can grab them at the end of our time together. So if today's your first day with us, we've been walking through the book of First Corinthians all year long, and we are coming to the final. Like the plane has stopped serving peanuts, the plane has stopped handing out drinks, the pilot has already said we are on our initial descent. Um, so we, we are almost done with this series that we've dubbed the Realignment Series, where we're realigning our church and our hearts after the kingdom of God, saying that it's easy um, to let maintenance go. It's easy to let things slide. Uh, but at some point, you have to realize that God has called us to do some things. God's called us to be about some things, and we want to be faithful and just to that. And so the Realignment Series was, was a series designed to help us look at the Word of God and apply that directly to the depths of who we are so that we wouldn't just be muddling through life. Because I, I read the Bible, and the Bible talks about us walking in victory, us walking in the victory of Christ, not us just making it. Uh, I, I'm tired of talking to Christians and asking the question, how are you doing, and getting the response, I'm making it. Brother and sisters, Christ got up from the dead. 
you shouldn't just be making it. Jesus victoriously came back, bursting forth in a day that we call Easter. We should be doing a little better than we're making it. So today we're going to talk about living in light of eternity. Now we, we don't know everything about eternity, just being 100% honest. We don't know everything about the end of times, just to be honest. Uh, the Bible is, is very clear that not everything was written down, but what was written down was there so that you may believe. In fact, the Bible goes on to say if every miracle of everything was written down, there would be too, there'd be too many books and there would not be near enough opportunity for you to learn everything that Jesus did in his ministry or everything that God has done in the days that we've been on this ball. We love the, the expectation of fall, don't we? It's coming, I promise you. As you got out of the car this morning on church property, it was just a swelter. Like, I walked from like one building to the other and was like, I need air condition. Like, it's, just, like, it's just thick. It's hot today. Like, and, and part of being in Alabama is longing for fall. We know like we got to go through a couple of things. Like we've got to go through the fake fall. Like that's going to come up. And then we've got to come through the third summer. It's going to show up sometime in late August. And right when you start getting ready to like get your pumpkin latte from Starbucks, you're going to walk outside again. It's going to be 104. So you just got to know those things. That's part of living here. Uh, but eventually fall will settle back into us. And, and we won't be a scorcher. And it'll be nice. Uh, that's when great baseball starts being played, the playoffs. That's when football starts playing, and everybody's just happy. The deer hunters are planning things. Like, everything's good. We love looking ahead to moments that we cannot wait to be here. Like a little child waiting to go uh, on vacation or a little child waiting to, to wake up and experience Christmas morning. We, we love the anticipation. But there's an event in the Bible that if we're not careful, time has jaded us from the precepts of reality that stand before us. And this is what I mean. Jesus said, I've gone to prepare a place for you. And when I'm done, I'm going to come back and get you. Now, Paul heard that. The, the, the writer Paul who wrote this text, he, he heard that and he lived with the optimism that Jesus would actually come back in his lifetime. That Paul didn't think he was going to see the grave before he saw King Jesus come and declare kingship over all things in the end times. Now we're 2,000 years from that. And if we're just being honest with one another, one of the things that can happen at this longevity of time where we haven't seen the return of King Jesus is we begin to get complacent where we are. In fact, I heard this statement this week, and it's, it's one of those statements that stopped me in my tracks. And I had to go back and hear it again and again and again. And it said this, one of the, one of the greatest feebles and one of the greatest tragedies in humanity is that we will often trade what we really want for what we can get right now. We'll often trade what we really want for what we can get right now. And if I were to pull the room and walk through and say, how many of you are ready for eternity? Like, you'd all be like, yeah, Jesus forever, yes. Some of you would be like, I may not be ready to go right now, but yeah, like, how am I going? Like, we begin to ask questions. But we're excited about lifetime with the no mores. We're excited about being with Jesus forever. We're excited about the, the presence of God and the, the life with no sin and no tears and, and, and no pain. We, we long for that. But we will often trade that for what we can get our hands on right now. Right now. How many of you have started a diet only for it to be thrown in the garbage by a king-size Reese cup? <laughs> by your response, I know I'm not alone. I want to talk today about living in light of eternity. If you've got your copy of God's Word, and I hope you do, 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 50. Uh, the, the apostle is going to talk about this. If you, if you have your phone digitally, use that. If you have the paper copy, use that. If you didn't bring either one of those, then the words will be on the screen. This is what Paul writes to the church. And he's, remember, he, he said a lot in these first 50 verses about living in light of a glorified body, living in light of being with God. And this is what he's going to tell them about the mystery and victory in Christ. He says, I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. 
Behold, I tell you the mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable. And we shall be changed. For the perishable body must put on the imperishable. And the mortal body must put on immortality. And when the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immorality or Im- immortality, excuse me, those are different. Then shall come to pass the saying of what's written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gave us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, stand fast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for our moments that we share in your word. God, pray that we would put on this view of eternity and live like it's today. God, help us not to grow weary in waiting, but may we do so with hoping and rejoicing, knowing that you've given us a day to live and serve you well. God, bless each person here. Bless each person watching on our digital platforms. Pray that you would move in a mighty way and speak to the depths of our humanity. In Jesus' name we pray and believe. Amen and amen. One of the things in church life that we have to be cautious of is not living with our future in our peripheral. It's easy to get caught in the here and now. And this is the way we often live. I don't know how far in your life you plan. I live by a calendar, and I'm sure many of you do as well. Um, we live by what's next, whether it's appointments or, or different work projects or different things you've got going on. We live by what's next. And if we're not careful, we can get so inundated with our right here, right now, that we lose sight of the big picture, which is living out for Jesus. So I think for us to be able to kind of make the the shift back to the biblical, um, the church must develop a a mind, a heart, and a soul for eternity. A mind, heart, and soul for eternity. Actually have life with God on our horizon. Actually have living for Jesus today as an object that we can actually achieve throughout our existence. Now listen, I know... Saying, I'm going to live for Jesus and driving in traffic can seem to be counterintuitive. I know that saying, I'm going to live for Jesus, but then you see that employee that you work with that makes you go, I know, I know the struggle of everyday life. I I know what it's like to go get gas and be shocked at how much fuel your truck can hold. I know what it's like to live in this world and constantly be inundated by everything that turns our attention and makes us refocus but what we have to be developing is a heart that says i'm here for a moment but i'm gonna be there forever and if we actually live like we're here for a moment but we're gonna be there forever we'll stock more in the forever than we do the here and the now you ever been in a place that you didn't want to be for very long just me like I've been to places that weren't very fun. Not every place I go is fun. I try to have the most fun wherever I can, but not every place. I, I remember when Caleb broke his arm when we were in Miami. Uh, we were on vacation. He breaks his arm. Now, that would normally just be a trip to the hospital, and we're all good, but this was a little bit different. Uh, I was, we were down there, and, and it was like this, the perfect storm of situations where I had locked a door on our camper, and Katie had went out it. You can go out that lock. But once the door shut, you can't get back into it. She didn't know I had done that. Her keys were inside. I was 20 minutes away refueling, getting some propane because we were fixing to go to Key West. And so we didn't want to buy all that down there. So we were just stocking up. So she calls me, hey, I'm locked out. Hurry back. Take your time. Do everything you got to do, but just hurry. While, he, while they're there, she's like, hey, y'all go to the playground, which is like the escape route of every parent ever. Y'all just go to the playground. So while he's on the playground, he's on the monkey bars. If you've ever had a kid on the monkey bars, then you've got a story like mine. He tried to catch himself as he was falling off the monkey bar to have a perfect break right under his elbow. And so I I pull up, and like, you know, the the most dad thing you can do in these moments is look at it and go, no, it's not broke. No. No. And I'm taking it, and I'm moving it. And he's like, ah! He's just screaming. I'm like, I don't think it's, I don't think it's. But it's checkout day for us. 
that we have to be off property in like 30 minutes. So I'm hooking up, and we're doing all these things. And meanwhile, he is just boohoo, And I'm like, well, we can go get it x-rayed, right? So they had an ortho, like, outpatient thing. So, like, we pull in. We're 55 feet long. That's how long from the front of our truck to the back of our camp. 55 feet. I'm not taking up, like, a parking spot. I'm taking up a row of parking spots. And she walks out and looks at me, and she says, his arm's broke, and they won't cast it here. Like, what in the world? So we immediately find this place to pull into. And when I tell you it was the most sketchy place that you could ever fathom, like I'm not saying illegal activity, ha- I know illegal activity was happening on the premises. Like, and I was like, nobody get out of the car! Because we have to drop the, we've got to go downtown. Like you could, obviously couldn't take the, the RV to Children's Hospital of Miami. Like that wasn't an option. And so we found this place, and we dropped the, the camper off, and everything. Was, all right, we go get the cast, and he gets this Tennessee orange cast that was hideous. <laughs> and we go, and we go get back to the camper, and I'm hooking back up. We're, we're 70 miles from Key West. We just want to get to where we're going so that we can process our last 12 hours. And this guy comes up to us, and he's like, we're so glad you're here. We'd love to see families at this place. And I was like, we're not staying here. <laughs> and he was like, well, we noticed you didn't set anything out. You didn't make, like, normally, like, like, like my wife has all, like, the cutesy things. We put out RVing, like, welcome to our campsite and lights and all of that. We, none of it. Like, we didn't even run the slide out. We were like, we ain't here. Like, this was a drop-and-go situation, and now we're like, we can't believe you're leaving. And we're like, we can't believe we're still here. Like, we just want to go. We don't want to be here. If we're not careful, we spend so much of our life and time focused on places that, if we're honest, we really don't want to be for very long. Like, when we get the, the grandness of heaven and the glorious riches of being with God, it makes this place look less and less and less appealing. But if we're not careful, we spend every moment of every day living and being right here. So for us to move forward walking with Jesus, it's developing the heart that I'm going to live, I'm going to develop a a mindset and a heart set and a soul set that my journey's with Jesus. And what that means is eternity is more than just our future, it becomes our hope. Eternity is more than just our future. Like any believer kind of recognizes that our, our future is in heaven. But it's not just our future. Because your future this year is also, also guess what, you're going to pay taxes again. Your future this year is, you're also going to go through trials and tribulations. So it's not just clinging to our future, but it's clinging to our hope. That one day this life is going to be no more. And what will be standing is not my 401k. It's not my job. It's not my successes. It's not my wealth. It's not my things. The only thing that makes it out of this life is my relationship with Jesus. And it's paramount to everything else because it's what I'm putting my hope in. So part of recognizing that is understanding that eternity is just, it's not just for the believer. We must remember, everyone will experience eternity somewhere. And it's a warm, fuzzy feeling like when we sing the song, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. Like we're like, yes, we're going to get there and we're going to throw down. But not everybody's going to be there. Not everybody's going to be there. We got to remember that for those of us who have been redeemed we're looking into eternity with god and that should bring up some joy i'm gonna be with the creator i'm gonna be with the one who spoke life i'm gonna be the one who drew man out of the ground i'm gonna be with the man who shut the mouths of lions i'm gonna be with the god who showed up in the midst of the fire i'm gonna be with the god who told the water to part and a thousand people walked across dry land i'm gonna be with him forever and that should bring up joy and passion into your life so i'm dealing with stuff up here got a little little cough (coughs) should bring up so much happiness into what we're going to be and it should be so exciting for those who have been redeemed 
But there's an opposite side of that coin that Jesus spent a lot of time talking about. Because while some people are going to spend eternity with God, other people will spend eternity apart from God. You see, God created heaven to be this place, this magnificent place where we can be with our Creator and our King. We get to be with all of our family who has gone on before us in faith, before us to a holy place where God is. We get to reunite with them. But not everyone has chosen to receive Christ. The sin that damns people to hell isn't lying. It's not cheating on your spouse. It's not even murder. The sin that sends people to hell is denying the Holy Spirit. Denying the existence of God. Refusing to accept Christ as your Savior. It's the sin that sends people to hell. And so when we experience the view of eternity and we get the reality that we're going to spend eternity with God, that's our hope. But when we recognize those who aren't in Christ yet are going to spend eternity in a place called hell, that's our mission. We have our hope and we have our mission. And both of them are wrapped in eternity. But we've let time go by. How many men, be honest with me today, women, don't answer this question. I don't want to say, woman, raise your hand. Because I ain't, I ain't doing no marriage counseling today. Man, how many of you have started a project at your house that you have yet to complete? If that's you, just simple. Just, you ain't got to do it long. Wives, quit, put, wives, put your hand. I told you. Do you know why men do that? We always bank. Listen, this is why men do it, ladies. Just so I'm going to let you in. In our pea brain size thinking, we always think that a day's coming when we won't be as busy as we are right now. And it is a lie that we continually tell ourselves. And we're thinking, hey, by the time I'm 40, I'm going to have all this other stuff worked out. But then you see a 40-year-old, and he's running 1,000 miles an hour, and he's saying, by the time I hit 60, I'm going to have time, I'm going to buy a boat, I'm going to do all these things that I ain't been doing because I've been working. And then you meet a 60-year-old, and he's grinding. He's like, I'm trying to do everything. I'm going to retire in two years, in three years, in five years, and I shut it down. Now i got a lot of stuff to do. I ain't got time. And then you meet somebody 65 who has been retired for six months, and they look at you and they say, I'm as busy as I've ever been. I go to the doctor 32 times a week. I don't have time. And meanwhile, the Holy Spirit, a.k.a. your wife, is like, why won't you get it done? We're always projecting that we're going to have more time. I want to have more time. I want to do it. Hey, I know you don't have to remind me every six months. I'm going to get back around to finishing that. We always punt to the future. But the church has to develop a right now mentality. With eternity in view, we have to begin to develop a right now attitude. Paul says in verse 52, he says, I need you to know this. And he says, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable. And we shall be changed, he writes, for the perishable body will put on the imperishable. He's talking, when, when God looks at Jesus... It says, go get your bride. There's not going to be an email that comes out and says, you got 30 days. Get it together. There's not going to be a text that comes out that says, you got 48 hours. Make it count. None of that's going to happen. Jesus says in Matthew 28, he says, I've given you every ounce of authority, every ounce of power that you need to go make disciples. Go baptize men, women, boys, and girls in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I'm giving you that. I need you to go do that. Because you don't know when I'm coming back. And you've got family that if today's the day, you've got family that if right now is the time, they're going to die and they're going to spend eternity in the judgment of God in a place called hell. We've got to develop a right now attitude and stop loaning against the bank of time that we'll get to it in the future. 
God's called the church to now, not future now. He's called the church to today. That's why the Bible says, for today is the day of your salvation. Right now is the moment in which you can be redeemed. Oh, we've got to develop a right now attitude. Because we don't know. We don't know the time or day of Christ's return. I'm going to help you today. I'm going to set you free. If you're flipping through the channels early on a Sunday morning, and you come across some buffoon on the TV, and he's telling you he's got it figured out, and this is where you like. This is where I get chuckled. This is where like I've had a little bit of seminary training. This is where I get a little 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 ha ha. When they're sitting there holding their English version of their Bible, and they're telling me that they have they've deducted through the reasoning, every seventh letter spells something that sounds like sounds something like like it could be. Every forty second thing, if you add it up, subtract it by fourteen, means it's going to be November the twenty seventh of next year. Every time you see that garbage, just just don't. Just turn it off. Just go put it on ESPN. It won't be any more spiritually edifying, but it it won't make you any, it won't make you as frustrated. Okay, we don't know the day in which Christ is going to return. We don't know the day. You know why God didn't tell us the day? How many of you have got children? How many if you called your children on the way home from work? And, or you told them in the morning, I'm going to work. I'm going to work. By the time I get home, all these chores better be done. By the time I get home, all these chores better get done. And then all of a sudden, right about quit time, your, your kids start texting you, hey, you on your way home? They're not asking because they're concerned with you. They're not asking because they, they really want to see mommy. They're asking because they have waited to the very end. And they're hoping that you got hung up at work because they've put everything off to the end. God didn't give us the end because he wants us to work in the now. God didn't give us the date because he wants us to work in the now. God didn't give you tomorrow because he wants you to get saved today. God has given us this moment in time, this moment in history. You are the church for 2023. God hadn't made anybody else other than you to go be the witness, to go be the voice, to go be the reasoning, to go to the highways and the byways, to look in the hedges and look beyond, to find people who haven't heard the gospel and bring them into faith and repentance. God has brought you right here, right now, for this moment so that King Jesus can be made holy and famous in our city. Right here, right now. So how do we do that? I'll give you four tips of how we do that. I'm going to say these quick, so right fast. Number one, we're going to mark every day as kingdom living. I want to help you. There's no off days of retirement for believers. You don't get that. We're going to live every day of our life like the kingdom matters. So we're going to live with kingdom living. We're going to leverage our faith so that others can come to Christ. We're going to be gospel sharers. Nobody comes to Christ because I'm good looking. They come to Christ because somebody shared the gospel with them. Nobody comes to Christ because our church has a a beautiful entryway. They come to Christ because somebody shared the gospel with them. We don't need to be propping ourselves up off base of our pedigree. We need to be leveraging our story. I once was lost, but now I'm found. And I want you to experience that as well. So we become gospel sharers. Oh, that the gospel would be on our tongue. Oh, that the gospel would be on our voice. Oh, that the gospel would be near and dear to every conversation we have. Because we're coming into football season, and every conversation I have to have is like, did you watch the Tide? Hey, did you see that Auburn game? And the answer to both of those are no. I'm like, no, what happened? Yeah, Shaven put up 73 points in the first quarter. And Auburn scored a touchdown. It's just, those are the conversations I get to have. So that's it. We become God. Like, we're always talking about things that we're passionate about. What if the gospel became the thing that we're most passionate about? How would that come out of your life and look like like you're you're actually living in light of glory? And then we'll be hyper-focused to ensure that our circle is ready to meet a holy God. Listen, if you're a mom or a dad and you've got a child today that hasn't accepted King Jesus... Be on your knees fighting for them. Pleading for them to be saved. Pleading for them to be redeemed. You say, Jeff, it's been 20 years. Then don't let it be 21. Keep praying. 
Because God isn't us, and that's really good news today. Because about the sixth time that my kid asked me the same question that he's asked me the last five times, I'm like, stop asking that question. I've answered it five different times. God, it's not like that. Aren't you glad that God has a lot more patience than we have? Do you know that God loves to hear you come before him? And he loves to hear you say, God, I've got this child who is in the far country. I've got this child who's wayward. And you know, and I'm praying right now that you would save him. I'm praying right now you'd put people around him to be gospel sharers. I'm praying. God doesn't get tired of hearing that prayer. And for a mom or dad, you should be fighting for your children. No matter how old or young they are, you should be fighting for them in prayer. But not only should you be fighting for your circle, you should be sharing with your circle. And sharing is not accepting in their mess and in their, in their livelihood. It's like you don't just celebrate everything, every sin. Every, that's not it at all. You can love people without condemning them. But every time we share a life with them and we're loving them, we're showing them the goodness of God. We're reminding them of what God has done. We're showing them without Jesus in my life, I wouldn't be near the person I am. We ensure our circle is ready to go meet a holy God because we know the standard heaven's not some elusive place where we hope we have the key to it the bible is explicit on how we get in jesus says this about himself he says i am the door if anyone enters by me he will be saved and he'll go in and out and he will find the pastures he says anybody who who comes by me they're going to have to be saved and notice that he used the term saved tying to the word salvation We have to experience salvation to get to come by Jesus. Look at what he didn't say. Because it may be more important than what he did say. Jesus didn't qualify you got to be good. Jesus didn't qualify that you got to not murder somebody. Jesus didn't qualify that you ain't ever stole nothing. I meet way too many people that stake eternity on being good. And hell's going to be slap full of good folk. He didn't come that you could be good. He came that you could be holy. He says later on, he he says in John 14, he he says, for everyone, this is what he said. Look at what he says in in John 14, 6. He said, Jesus says, he says, I am the way and I am the truth and I am the life. In a world that says there is no truth, Jesus says, I am the truth. In a world that says we don't know the way, Jesus says, I am the way. And in a world that says everything's dying, Jesus says, and I am the life. And he says, no one, and this is an imperative, no one comes to the Father unless they come by me. And so we know the standard. Eternity has a standard, and it's Jesus. Jesus has a standard. It's salvation. So for the church, we see our hope but we see our mission. We see our hope. Man, one day that's going to be us. One day that's going to be us. But until then, we're operating in mission. Until then, I've I've got to put on the armor and I've got to go out another day and live like Jesus matters at my place of business. I've got to go out and live like like Christ is king. And I've got to go out and I've got to share in the victory. Oh, I love this text. If you underline in your Bibles, I hope, I hope you've got 56 underlined. It says, the sting, the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God who gives us victory. Thanks be to God who gives us victory. He says, the, the sting of death is because of sin. God never intended for us to, to be people who die. We brought that on in the garden. The sin imputed to us at our birth. The sin imputed to our our world through humanity was brought forth by one man and one woman in a garden. And their sin has been contagious to every generation. And the fact that we die is the judgment on us. He says, last week we talked about this. Through the first Adam came death and through the second Adam came eternity. And we're living in light of the first Adam. Which means everyone who lives has to fight the monster of sin. 
every single one of us. The Bible says this, a man is a few days and full of trouble. But Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father unless they come by me. Which means there's a way. And that way is through the bloodshed of Jesus Christ. Anyone who would accept Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior, they don't have to wonder, they can know. They don't have to guess, they can know. So we begin to live. We begin to live through the victory of eternity, which means our hope is in our future and our mission is right now. And this is what that looks like. It means that we must be steadfast. We must be steadfast in our way. of I'm going to live for Jesus and I'm going to be steadfast. I'm going to live for Jesus and I'm holding on. Nothing's going to make me bend or break. I'm living for Jesus because eternity matters. I'm living for Jesus because I've got a, a friend who doesn't know yet. I'm living for Jesus because I've got a child who doesn't know yet. I'm living for Jesus because I know the light that we're living has to be seen like a city on a hill. I'm living for Jesus and I'm not going to stop. The Bible says, therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast. And then he says, be immovable. Be like a brick wall. Be like a brick wall that people have to go through. Everybody who sees you should know, hey, they're a believer. Everybody who sees you should know, hey, they, they church folk, they love Jesus. Watch out for them. They're probably going to get you saved and hand you a pamphlet. Just watch out for them. Everybody who sees you should know that, hey, I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I'm not who I once was, and I'm not who I want to be, but I'm better than I was. And it's not because of me. It's because of my king. We become immovable immovable and then he says oh you must abound in the work he says be steadfast be immovable and always my bible says and always be abounding in the work of the lord notice there's so much that that verse doesn't say it doesn't say hey if you're having a good day work for the lord it doesn't say, hey, if you've got extra time to work in, work for the Lord. It doesn't say, hey, as long as you feel healthy, work for the Lord. It says, be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Always. Because your labor is not in vain. When we recognize that what we're doing is for the Lord, it changes everything. So when you show kindness and graciousness to your neighbor, you're doing that for the Lord, not for you. When you show grace to, person, to someone who you don't think deserves to see grace, that's a gift for them from the Lord. I had a friend of mine, a guy that I love dearly, he got sick, and they found out he had cancer. And it was a, a cancer that you don't come back from. And we walked with him through those first couple of weeks of devastation, and we walked through the weeks of denial. We walked through the weeks of, of acceptance. And then there came a day in his life when a, a switch, if you will, flipped in his psyche. And I remember I was sitting down eating Mexican food because that's what good Christians do. I was sitting down eating some Mexican food with him one day and the waitress came up to us and asked us what we wanted to drink. And of course, I said sweet tea because I love Jesus. And he, he ordered some, I think something else. And he said, hey, why I got you here, can I ask you, if you were to die tonight, would you go to heaven and be with God forever? And like, I was taken back. He wasn't, all, he wasn't talking to me, he was talking to the waitress. And she just looked down at him, and I looked over at him, and we had this very awkward moment. He did something I was not expecting him to do. He was audacious in his faith enough to share it. And that was the first time in our relationship that I'd ever seen him share his faith. So she, she said, I don't know. And they talked for a little bit and she walked away. And I hadn't said a word. I'm sitting there like a deer in the headlights. 
And I looked at him and I said, no, res- no, no, no disrespect, but where did that come from? And he said, this is, he said, I've been given a glimpse into my mortality. My day to make sure that everybody I know and love is saved is drawing near. I've seen my death date written down on a piece of paper. And I'm going to live like it's today. He said, so I hope you don't get uncomfortable. But everybody we meet that I get to have a conversation with, I'm going to share the gospel with them. And I remember sitting there asking the question to my heart. Why do we have to wait till we're dying to start living for Jesus? When he says, you don't know. In a twinkling of an eye, the dead in Christ will rise first. And then those of us who are saved will be called together in the air. And there we will be with God. Man, we live like we've got years. We live like we've got decades. I'm not telling you, hey, don't plan on next year. Like, I don't have that calendar. I'm not telling you, hey, don't worry about paying that credit card off. That's going to be the devil's problem. I'm not telling you that. I'm not telling you that. But I am telling you to stop borrowing time from God that you don't know that's there. Start living like your end date is coming quicker than you want it to because that's all of our realities. You don't know the date and time. You don't know how much time you have left. So Paul says, celebrate the victory of eternity by living out that Christ actually got up from the grave. We've talked a lot about eternity this morning. And I hope we all get to go to the same place, probably at different times. But I hope some of you will go before I go. And if you go before I go, I can't wait to see you there. And if I go before you go, I hope you get there. But nobody gets in on accident. Nobody gets in because their grandmother was an outstanding woman. Nobody gets in because their their daddy's a deacon or their, their grandpa was a Baptist preacher. You get into heaven by walking past the gate of Jesus Christ. There's no back door. Amazon Prime can't help you get there in two days. None of that. Jesus says, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. No one comes to the Father unless they come by me. Have you come to the place Have you come to the place where God's not king of your brain, he's king of your life. God's not king of of your thought, he's king of your soul. God's not just the, the salvation of your grandmother, he's your salvation. A guy in the Bible came up to Jesus and asked him probably one of the most impressive, profound questions that's ever been asked. He said, looked at Jesus and he said, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus looked back at him and he said, you must be born again. You must come to a place in your life when you say, no longer I, but it's going to be Christ in me. Come to a place where you say, Lord, I'm a sinner and I need you to save me. Come to the place when you say, Lord, I've made a mess of my life and now I'm giving it to you. Will you be my God Will you be my Lord? Everybody in this room, everybody watching online will spend eternity somewhere. Why don't you choose God? Why don't you choose Jesus? Why don't you choose heaven? And why don't you choose it now? You pray with me. Lord, for the moments we shared today in your word, I pray that you would convict hearts, you would guide minds and, and spirits to be drawn in. God, for that brother or sister today that doesn't know you, I pray that they would be saved today. 
for that, for that teenager, for that, that child that's in this room or watching online that doesn't know you. I pray today would be the day they call out to you. They call out with confession and tell you they're sinners and they need to be saved. They call upon your name and ask to be delivered. You tell us when people call that they shall be saved. God, for those brothers and sisters who have been walking like time was going to be forever. God, may they find a place of repentance today. They've been betting on you that you wouldn't come. God, may we, like the Apostle Paul, live with the expectation that it's going to be in our lifetime. You tell us to make hay while the while the sun is shining. You tell us to move while it's day. Because the night's coming. Like a thief in the night, you will come. And when we least expect it, those trumpets will blow. And time will be no more. May there be no one sitting on the fence of trying to decide when that time happens. May they be standing firmly on the rock that is Jesus. Whatever you need to do in this invitation, Father, we trust you. If people need to join our church, may they come. If people need to be saved, may they come. If people want to repent, may they come find an altar, trusting and pleading before you. And you'll hear their prayers. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. You stand with me this morning. I must tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus. And he will help me. Over the world, the victory to win. I must tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus. I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus. I must tell you.
Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you, praise team. You may have a seat for just a moment. We've got some ushers who are going to come. If you're our guest and you filled out a Connect card, this is the great time to give that to us. Let that be your token of worship. If you're our guest, listen, we never, ever, ever invite our, our guests here to give. We don't want you to feel that pressure. We don't want you to feel that anxiety. Um, our membership here is the ones who we give for. That's who we give the opportunity to give for. Uh, giving is certainly a biblical exercise that we do. It's a spiritual exercise that we do. Giving is directly connected to our heart. And as we give to the kingdom, God works in the depths of our heart. And we can spend the next hour letting people talk through the testimonies about when they got serious about giving, God got serious about them, and they've walked in the blessings of that. And so if you're questioning that, we'd love to talk with you about that. Um, but again, if you're our guest, we just don't want you to feel that pressure. When that plate comes by, just pass it, drop that Connect card in, and, and that would be more than enough. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the chance to give. God, thank you for what you're doing in the life of our church. God, for the two ladies that we're going to hear today that you have redeemed, that you call from death to life. God, we praise you. God, may we honor you as a church and glorify you in all that we do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. It miss Joy. Like she did she bother anybody else besides me? Like she's so talented. Like I've seen her in, have a conversation with me while just playing. I can't think and write my name in the same time and she's just look at what I can do. And she's so humble. It's incredible. Um, hey, we've got some folks we want to introduce to you today. Um, first, Miss Marley, you come up here. Marley gave her life uh, to Christ. Uh, she went to student camp with our teenagers. And while there, God was working on her, and she came home, and it was just a, a thing that God just continued in her heart. And so she, she has asked Jesus to be her Lord and Savior, and she's repentant. She's walking with the Lord now. <clears throat> so we rejoice with her. We're so excited for her, her family and her grandparents and her mom and dad. We just rejoice with them. Um, and then we have Miss Charlotte. Miss Charlotte, you come up here. Miss Charlotte Nunley has, we've been talking with Charlotte for a while about Jesus, and it's so, we, we, like, we, we deal with kids with kid gloves, and we don't want to press something, we don't want to manipulate, we want a child to willingly call upon the name of the Lord as the Lord's leading them, not an adult's persuading them, 
And so we, we, when I tell you we're, we're cautious, we're probably way too cautious. Um, but we, wanna, we want a child to know that God is calling them from death to life. And um, she gave me the, probably the most on-point answer of why she got saved um, that some of you adults could probably, y'all need to do better, okay? <laughs> um, she said, I'm a sinner and I need Jesus into my life and he's going to be my king forever. He's going to be my God through eternity and he's going to be my God forever and he's now in my heart forever. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> so we're excited for both of these, both these young ladies, and we know you are too. So if you're, if you're willing to rejoice with them and just let heaven know, we're thankful that God is saving people this morning. If that's you, will you just say amen and give the Lord just a hand clap of praise. <laughs> All right. Um, Tell you what, y'all, family, y'all come stand by, by these young ladies. Don't make them stand up here by themselves. That's so. And, and if you've been a part of Sunday school teachers, if that's y'all, y'all come stand by your people. Let them know how proud you are. Mr. Frank Miller gave me a note, and if, he don't, if I don't read it, he's going to shoot me. Um, there it is. Hey, a couple of announcements. Some of these are really important, so I need you to hear them. Um, <clears throat> we need ushers. Uh, in every service starting in September September the 10th we're moving to two services we're going to do a 915 service and a 1045 service we're going to need ushers in both of those we're going to need parking lot attendants in both of those we're going to need more greeters we're going to need more people and guess where the people are you right here <laughs> right here so if you're living in a world where somebody else is going to do it you're lying to yourself all right it's you. We need you to step up and do something. In fact, if you're willing to serve in any capacity, will, will you find Miss Debbie Davis and say, write my name down, put me somewhere. I, I need to serve my local church. And she will write your name down, and she will put you in, and you will start getting texts and emails from her every week. It's your time. All right? So be sure to, be sure to, to do that. Don't forget, Young at Heart is happening this week. Um, a lot of great things. Today is your last day to give through Touchpoint. We've been using Touchpoint as, a, uh, as a, a way that we give online. A lot of you give online. Uh, we've been doing that for uh, several years now. Uh, we have gone to a new company uh, called PushPay. Tomorrow morning, that, that link will be live. So if you're reoccurring giving, we, we're gonna, you're going to hear from us this week. We're going to help you make that transition so that it's not scary or anything like that. We're not going to charge you twice or anything like that. Um, but we want to we want to let you know, give you a heads up. This is happening. This is going to save us money on some transaction fees, but it's also going to work seamlessly with our brand new app that will be out in a couple of weeks. And so we want to we want to be preparing for that. So you'll see that change. It's a lot more user friendly. They don't ask for your mother's maiden name. They don't ask for like what's your dog your first dog's name back in 1964. They don't ask for any of that. It's a lot simpler. And it's the safest platform online. It really is. And so don't forget, a lot of things are happening. A lot of things are changing. Uh, but aren't you glad to see through baptism to begin and through salvation in the end, God is working here at our church. Amen. So we will we'll be scheduling baptism, and that will be great. The baptism room is already right there, so we can do it pretty quick. Uh, it's heavy. We don't like to move it unless we have to. Um, We'll be rejoicing with them. We know you will. Come by, celebrate with them. Let them know how proud of them you are and how much you love them. Let's pray. Lord, it's been good to be in your house. It's been good to be with your people. It's been good and edifying to be with your spirit. God, bless, bless these folks who have decided to follow you. God, we, we do. We pray over Marley. We pray over Charlotte. We pray over these young women that you will build them up to be women who walk well before you in the days they've been given to live. God, let us be a church who not only supports them but helps them thrive may we disciple them well may we walk with them well may we celebrate the work you're doing in their heart it's in jesus name i pray and believe amen and amen <laughs>
on our website. There's a link in the video below, palmerdalecross.org. You can give right there and continue to further the kingdom. All of this, all of this content takes so many hours every single week, and our tech team does an amazing job. So as you give and you give to our church, that, that enables us to keep putting out information like this. I know that we love you. We're here for you. If you have any questions for us, you can email us at info at palmerdalecross.org and we'll respond to that. We love you. Thank you for tuning in today. Have a great week.